today we're talking crepe myrtles and there's no one better to talk about crepe myrtles than with the legendary local <laughs> Dr. Carl Whitcomb. And we're so excited. Thank you, Dr. Whitcomb, for inviting us out here to your research trials, if you will, right? You're right. This is, this is part of 65 acres that I call my fun, fun location. <laughs> uh, crepe myrtle is just one of the plants that I work with. But what we're walking through are crepe myrtle seedlings in their third growing season. And as you walk down a row, these are all seedlings from the same parent. In a few cases, it, like in starting here, they're all reds mm -hmm. and in otherwise other places they're pinks. But the genetic variability among crepe myrtle is huge and we're still learning about just how diverse the species is. We haven't, in my opinion, we haven't opened all those doors and looked behind them <laughs> in terms of flower color. I still think orange is possible. Uh, you know, people said red wasn't possible. Two guys with the National Arboretum, they spent tens of thousands of hours studying pigments of crepe myrtle and Rosa Sharon. They published a lengthy paper on what they did and how they did it. And their conclusion was, I think I can quote it exactly. They said, it's highly unlikely that there will ever be a crepe myrtle with true red flowers. <laughs> Bogus, <laughs> uh, because dynamite is as red as a Coke can. So is red rocket. So is double dynamite. And the, and the fact that uh, the guys at the National Arboretum said it's highly unlikely you'll ever get a red one. Well, in 1996, I introduced the one named Dynamite. And we were early enough in it to where I got some key trademark names. Dynamite. And we've had to defend it in court. People want to name it Dynamite. No, 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 no. We own Dynamite. Mm. But, um, so I introduced that in 96. I think it was 2000 either 99 or 2000, the phone rang one day and it was a person with the Chinese consulate in San Francisco. They wanted to come and they'd already seen the plant obviously, but see, they wanted red flowered crepe myrtle for the 2008 Olympics. Mm. How are they gonna get them? Four people. Luda came to Stillwater, Oklahoma, sat across from my desk, and two of them do a pretty good, uh, had a pretty good knowledge of plant science. But we ended up negotiating a deal. I gave them enough dynamite crepe myrtle to get them started. And if you watch the 2008 Olympics, there were some big blocks of red crepe myrtle. Over oh, there. Okay. What I wanted in exchange, I wanted a kilo of crepe myrtle seeds from the northernmost native population. The crepe myrtle is native to China, from up near the North Korean border, extending along the eastern foothills of the Himalayas until it gets high in Burma, too high for them. I wanted seeds from up there for in the hopes of being able to get more cold tolerance right. and could move the, if I could grow plants like this and not have any injury to the tops in zone six or five or something, it'd be a real asset. Well, I did finally get a, a kilo of crepe myrtle seeds, but <laughs> none of them were as good as what I already had. But 2.2, but uh, yeah, 2.2, a kilo is 2.2 pounds. That's a pile of crepe myrtle <laughs> seeds. I only planted a, you know, about half a dozen rows out. and No, 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 no. But uh, to me, the irony, the plant's native outside their back door, but they didn't have any red ones. In the native populations, there's pinks and lavenders and a few whites. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed you know, telling that story many times. But, well, uh, and, and unfortunately, yours, a lot of them suffered from the winter freeze um, as well. So these, a lot of these were shrubs, correct? big shrubs. Yeah, um, they, they were some bigger than this, not yeah. a lot, but... Uh, the threshold point with the genetic material that I'm working with and have for all these years 
is about zero to minus two. If it drops below that, okay. the, the top is killed. Okay. The, the crown and the root system is not, and so they come back with gusto because of that support. But uh, to lose the top is undesirable. But you come to something like this, and you say, well, is this, is this good enough? No. It's, <laughs> it's, it's nice, but it's not good enough. See, if, if you're in a plant breeding program, unless you come up with something that is better than anything out there on the market, you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, looking at them here, you've got so much variability. So yeah. these are Lagostromia indica, is that correct? Right. Um, and tell us a little bit about, obviously you're very selective. I would take any one of these, <laughs> but you probably are gonna send half of these to your burn pile, is that correct? Oh, 98% of them will go on the burn pile. Okay. Right. So tell us a little bit about your um, selection process, the okay. time period that you spend on those seedlings and that sort of All thing. Right. I, I began in the spring of 86. I collected seeds from one old plant, downtown Stillwater. Every seedling I have grown since then, through 24 generations, are all descendants from that parent. Oh. But what I do is I plant out a population such as this block. I may save three, five, and the rest of them go on the burn pile. But if I can take this plant and not spend time developing seeds that I don't want, that's an asset. Mm -hmm. The plants that produce flowers but no seeds are showing much greater drought tolerance. Because mm. if I don't spend energy going into those seeds, where's it going to go? They're not as stressed, so they can go into root it's, development. It's going to go, yes, it's going to go into the stems and roots. Okay. But of course, more flowers as well. So it, it, it shows up. Uh, it was a hypothesis for a long time, but obviously the hypothesis was right. Well, and on several thousand crepe myrtles, this is just one block that we're looking at right yes, now. You yes. have even more blocks. Yes. Uh, it's, you probably start seeing some of those uh, hypotheses come to light. Oh, you do. You do. I'm, you know, I'm enough of a scientist that I speculate, you know, here's mm -hmm. what I think may happen. And here, this, by selecting that semi-dwarf plant, maybe I can get more dwarf ones mm -hmm. or a different color. Uh, I keep watching for any red that has a hint of orange to it. And I've been doing that for generations. Can I move that further? Only time will tell. So and what's, what's the next characteristic that you're looking for? Obviously the orange are you and, and one that doesn't produce seed. Are you looking for anything related to the bark? Um, you've clearly gotten rid of the powdery mildew out here in yeah. your stock. So. All right, there's another disease that years ago uh, called Cercospora leaf spot. And we would see it and, you, well, no, no problem. But it has become a major problem. And it causes the older leaves to drop on the plant. And as you lose any leaves off on the plant, you're losing your energy source. And so the whole system begins to decline. Um, so I'm making some progress. I've, I've got plants that, that don't show any Sacospora lisa, so that's a plus. The other ones that I'll show you at some point in time, but there may be one up here in this row, are some of the dwarfs. Mm. Uh, instead of having, you know, typical crepe myrtle, three, five, seven stems, and these never get pruned. It's just we planted it, and this is what it what it does. But uh, some of these now, instead of producing five stems maybe produce 40 stems, 50 stems, and they grow like little footstools. I mean, just a little, uh, a little like pump. a chrysanthemum, mm -hmm. okay? And I think those have a huge potential for a lot of small properties, small spaces, and, um, but unfortunately, none of them have flowered yet. Mm. I began to see that trait six years ago. I now have well over a hundred with that growth habit. I'm still waiting for the first one to really bloom. Wow. They will. So yeah. clearly patience goes into this and your vetting process is intense um, for all of these. And I have to say, you've got, a, you've got better uh, self-control to go ahead and eliminate <laughs> than I would out here. 
But Dr. Wickham, thank you so much for sharing this with us and you're, telling us about your process out here. You're welcome. And just remember, few things flower better than a crepe room. Put on more show. It's beautiful. We hope you enjoyed this video as part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on the OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion. Thank you.